Good morning, everybody. I am Lauren Cohen. I am a Canadian living in Florida and functioning as an international lawyer and cross-border expert, and welcome to Investing Across Borders. We have a very special guest with us today, one of the preeminent investors across borders. He is known as, and I love this, and Mike, I hope you won't mind me saying this, but when I was searching up his information way back when we first met, he is known as the wealthiest homeless man in Canada. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard <laughs> that before, right? I just heard that last week at Thanksgiving, actually, in my buddy's there, house. There you go. <laughs> and why, Mike Wolf, are you called the richest homeless man in Canada? Usually because you're- well, well, COVID put a little bit of a damper on things <laughs> uh, because I normally travel full-time. I'm, I'm nomadic and uh, usually bounce around, you know, from country to country. And that's what I, I love. And so I built that lifestyle for myself and it's all built around the passive income that I've created over the years through real estate. And so, uh, so quite often people, people find it very ironic that this guy who owns a lot of real estate doesn't live in any of his own real estate. He's in <laughs> hotels and Airbnbs. So there's a bit of irony to it, but that's, it I love it. It is, but it goes to show you that uh, you don't have to actually, so a lot of people think that you have to own real estate to be an investor, I'm, I, you know, live, whatever, own real estate and live in the real estate that you own. But the truth is that the, the, the freedom of the lifestyle that Mike has allows him to be everywhere that he needs to be at any time and to have that nomadic laptop lifestyle that so many people are searching for these days. And I think as time goes on, that's going to become even more prevalent during and post COVID because people are realizing, you know, I've been, I, I get um, um, job notices from Indeed, not that I'm looking for a job, but about, you know, in-house counsel and legal counsel. And so you like now all of a sudden I could work for Amazon in Seattle, or I could work for a big law firm in New York city. It doesn't matter because nobody's going into the office. Right. Exactly. So, so true. You know, I think a lot of uh, businesses that didn't think that their employees could work from home, have now realized, hey, why are we paying all this money for this, you know, expensive office space downtown when, you know, if we get rid of that, that's a major expense. And so we're, we're seeing, you know, a lot of trends where, where people are doing things that they never, you know, we never thought we'd be doing some of this stuff. And I, I wish I would have bought Zoom shares uh, last year because, you know, uh, I feel like I live on Zoom lately. It's, it's, we do. Uh, and amazing. So yep. places like Amazon, how we, how we, how we buy stuff, everything is shifting right now. And so really the key, uh, if you want to be successful in real estate is to figure out what those trends are that's and right. kind of get there before everybody else figures out what's happening. So that's really- And you have done such a great job of that. So on that note, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Mike, your background and what got you into this crazy world of real estate? Yeah, well, I mean, if we go way, way, way back to uh, middle of grade 12, I had zero idea of what I wanted to be when I grew up. And uh, my parents had always driven into my- Head that you should be doctor, lawyer, doctor, lawyer. That's all right. I ever heard growing up. And so by default, I'm, I'm terrified of blood. So doctor was definitely <laughs> off the table. And so I thought lawyer and, uh, you know, it looked pretty cool on TV. You know, they always have the fancy office. LA Law, right? <laughs> it looked really good on TV. But anyway, I, I went and got my first uh, degree. And I'm sure you can relate to this. By the end of getting the first degree, I had all these student loans. And I thought, well, before I go rack up more student loans, I really want to get these things paid off. And so I got a job, actually, a buddy of mine, his uh, mother was a manager at the phone company, which back in those days was union and it was government run oh, yeah. and, and government owned. And so paid, paid really well. And while I was there uh, trying to pay down these student loans, I bought my first residence. And then my mortgage broker calls me up one day. And so goes, wait a minute. Hold on just a moment. I'm sorry. Backtrack. You bought your first residence when you were just finished grade 12? Uh, not just finished grade 12. Uh, this was a few years. Oh, I'm sorry. Grade. You said after your first degree. Oh, after my first degree. Okay. Yeah. This is, so I had, I had my first degree and, uh, so I got this job at the phone company, bought my first residence. And shortly after I bought it, my mortgage broker calls me up and goes, Hey Mike, if you want, you know, you're making good money. Uh, your credit's good. If you want, I can get you another mortgage so you can buy another property. And I go, why would I want why? another property? <laughs> and I, I, I wish I, uh, I wish I got that call every day now. That never that call never comes in anymore. But <laughs> but anyway, he, he says, well, Mike, you buy another property, you put a tenant in there, they're paying your mortgage for you. And whatever, you know, whatever rent you get over and above that is, you know, free, free cash flow. Right. And not only that, you know, 25 years from now, that mortgage is done. And then it's all it's all gravy, and that's your retirement. You go, that kind of makes sense. And so back then I I, I you know, being a real estate investor wasn't even on my radar. 
And even, even after I bought that house, I never really thought of that as, okay, this is going to be my career. I just thought this is my long-term, I'm going to hold this property. I'm going to go finish paying off my loans. I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to become a lawyer. And, and that was what I thought my destiny was until uh, probably two years after I bought uh, that property, the market took off. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, in the last two years, I made this much at the phone company and I made this much in real estate and I don't even know what I'm doing in real estate. <laughs> Uh, but I kind of got the bug at that point. And, uh, you know, I thought this is the first time in my life that I found something that I really like. I could see myself doing this like every day. So I did what any, uh, any kid in their mid twenties would do. when they have this all of a sudden big paycheck. I quit my job, told them I'm, I'm not working here anymore. And then I, I went and I remember telling my parents that, uh, <laughs> I'm not going back to law school and, uh, that didn't go over very well, but, <laughs> Um, so my mother was always saying, well, why don't you go get your next degree? So you have something to fall back on and then you can always do real estate later. And I thought, no, like that being the lawyer, that's your dream. That's not my dream for me. That's your dream for me. And mm -hmm. so, so I got, I got pretty cocky and I thought I knew everything there was to know about real estate because here, here I am in my mid twenties with, you know, uh, all of a sudden a bit, a pretty big chunk of equity. And, uh, yeah. so. And so ahead I, of the curve in so many ways, cause we're almost the same age and nobody in my world, in their mid twenties, I mean, everybody was in law school with me. So you were yeah, well, way ahead of the curve. Well, here, here's a problem. You know, when you have a big success at an early age and you think you know how to win the lottery, you think you know how to mm. duplicate it. Right. On the one hand, it gave me some capital to play with. On the other hand, I didn't really have any, I mean, I, I just got lucky. There's nothing that I did that turned that into a, uh, a big paycheck. The reason it was a big paycheck is my time just happened to be really, really lucky. So when you, when you win the lottery, that's great. But if you burn through all that money, as so many people who win the lottery do, when you go through that money, you can't duplicate it because there's nothing that you did uh, that, re that was skillful. No that system, you right? right? So I had no systems. Um, right. So, but I, but I was just very, uh, I guess, a know-it-all, you could say at that point. Nowadays, I teach my students, don't be a know-it-all, be a learn-it-all. Uh, but that's right. um, so I, I proceeded to do another real estate deal, but I realized, hey, I just quit my job at the phone company. So now I can't qualify for a mortgage anymore. I didn't oh. kind of think about that before I quit. And then I also, uh, you know, I didn't really have like any skill set. So I didn't really know what I was doing. So I just thought I'm going to buy another property and I'm going to somehow figure out how instead of waiting two years, like I did on the first one, like every 60 or 90 days, I'm going to get another paycheck like this. But I didn't really have, have a plan on how to do it. So to make a long story short, I had a very humbling experience where I managed to lose a lot of my money on the next deal. And uh, um, that, that was really a pivotal moment because, uh, you know. Lose, did you say lose? I lost. I lost. I lost a pretty good chunk of money on the next deal because I didn't really know what I was doing. I just thought, um, you know, and you got to remember the first deal was meant to be a long term hold. That was meant to be something that, that was my retirement. Oh. And then the next deal is like I all of a sudden had all these number signs, you know, floating through my head. <laughs> And all this uh, ego thinking, you know, I'm not going to wait 25 years. I'm going to do this like every 60 days. Why can't I make a six figure paycheck every 60 days? That's what I thought. Um, anyway, so I actually made a lot of money and it was a very humbling experience because I, and the reason, the only reason that I kind of got back up and forced myself to do more real estate, it would have been very easy just to say, okay, you know, my mother was right. I'm going back to law school. But the only reason I didn't is when you're in your mid twenties, it's very hard for you to tell your parents that they were right. Oh yeah. So. I thought I am going to figure truth. I'm going to figure this out. So I actually uh, hired my first mentor and basically said, "Hey, listen, I've got still some money left. I want to do a deal with you, uh, and I'm willing to put up the cash, but I want you to teach me as we go. I want you to show me exactly what you do, and I'll give you, you know, I'll give you, you know, part of the profits from this deal." And so that was uh, the only reason why I'm here talking about real estate today. Otherwise, we'd be having a lawyer to lawyer chat right now. Perhaps. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, and, uh, and, and I, I think it's great for some people to be lawyers, by the way, I'm not in any way dissing lawyers. I am like the most non-argumentative person ever. I'm it's like, true, you are. I, no laid back. I would have made a horrible lawyer. So I don't even know what my parents were thinking for me. Well, but I don't anyway. know, Mike, because not all lawyers are. Well, I know are, it's not always litigious, you know. Right. Litigious. I mean, you could be that lawyer that's writing deals and, and closing deals. I mean, I could have seen you being an M&A lawyer and something like that, which is more along the speed of what I do. I've, yeah. I've, the only time I've been in court is when I got divorced. So just saying. Oh, okay. So, so anyway. I suspect based on what I know about myself now that if I would have become a lawyer, I probably would have hired a bunch of people, a bunch of paralegals, let them right. do all the work. And I, right. I think I would have ended up in real estate anyway. I think that was my, right. uh, 
the path that I was meant to be on. So in any case, you know, like I said, the only reason I'm still in real estate, the only reason that I, um, you know, got back up and did my next deal, because it would have been so easy just to say, okay, maybe I don't know what the heck I'm doing, uh, is because I couldn't tell my parents that they were right. And I burnt my bridge at the phone company. I don't recommend people do that, by the way. When you're first starting out, don't quit your job. It would have been so much easier had I kept that at least for a little bit longer to, you know, qualify for mortgages and stuff. So. And also uh, have a little bit of a cushion too, right? Absolutely, because it was nice getting that paycheck every two yeah. weeks. But like I said, you know, if that, that, if that success would have happened to me, you know, maybe in my 40s instead of mid 20s, I probably would have been a little bit uh, smarter and a little bit less cocky about the whole thing. But, uh, you know, mid 20s, uh, you know, I think, you know, being, especially being a guy, uh, you know, sometimes gets the best of our ego and we just think we know it all. And, uh, but yeah, that's kind of my really lengthy story of how I got into real estate totally by mistake. And so when I get people that come to me, and they say, hey, you know, uh, you know, they say, for example, well, I'd love to get into real estate, but I've got no money. It's like when I first started, I was aspiring to get to no money. I was like negative 25,000 student loans. I was trying to get to zero, number one. And number two, you know, I don't people come to me and they have this passion and they want to learn, but that, you know, they say, oh, well, I don't, I don't think I could be successful. And then I tell them, listen, I wasn't even trying to be successful in real estate. And by mistake, I got into this industry. And I only became passionate about it when I got that big paycheck. That's when the passion started. I never had a, I never, like back in those days, I mean, if you told somebody I'm a real estate investor, they go, well, what do you do for a living? Right, like, right. That was, that was right. something you did on the side with your money is you bought some real estate. Right. So, uh, so anyway, times have obviously changed over the years, but that, that is exactly how I got my start. And uh, uh, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm glad I had that very humbling experience at the beginning because uh, it caused me to go from, like I said, being a, a know-it-all to a learn-it-all. And uh uh, I've learned a lot of things over these 31 years. So, Mike, when you um, when you started, were you investing in Calgary? Where were you? Where was your investing happening? Yeah, but, well, back then I did exactly what I tell people not to do now, and that's invest close to home, okay. unless you know home happens to be a really good market where the where the numbers make sense. So yeah, I started off in Calgary and uh, did all my deals. Every single deal I did was in and around Calgary for the first you know, first half of my career, pretty much. Oh, okay. And then, and then a, a buddy of mine moved down to Las Vegas and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he, he, uh, uh, he was a, a physio physiotherapist as we call it in Canada, physical therapist, as you guys call it. And he, uh, he got a job in Las Vegas at a hospital and I started to go down and visit him every, you know, every couple of weeks. Cause I thought, Hey, every I got a couple place. of weeks. Uh-huh. Yeah. Cause I got a free place to stay in right. Vegas. In Vegas. Why not? Exactly. It's only a two, two, two and a half hour flight from Calgary. So I'd go right. down and, and I had a different addiction than most people go to Vegas. Their addiction might be gambling and partying and drinking. My, my addiction back in those days was I could not walk past or drive past an open house and not go in and look at the uh-huh. house. It was just in my blood. And so every, every time I go visit him, I noticed that the prices kept going up and up and up and up and up. And I'm going, man, this is like, this would be so much easier to make a living here than it is up in Canada. And so that was the start of my U.S. Uh, career. I started to buy uh, properties. This is before the recession kicked in. And, uh, you know, back in those days, kind of of, accidental in a way, not perfect. Yeah, a, a lot of the stuff in my life is kind of, I don't know, the universe seems to always put me on this, on the right uh, path. Uh, without the mindset. Me. Yeah. If, so anyway, so I was very grateful because just by, you know, just by chance, my buddy moved there and I just started to look at real estate. Next thing you know, uh, you know, a lot of people from California were moving to uh, Las Vegas to lower their cost of living. And that's mm-hmm. happening again right now. You see mm-hmm. a lot of people trying to get away from the high cost of living and the high taxes in California. And so I, I just started flipping homes to uh, Californians back in those days. And it was way easier than trying to do this in Calgary. Uh, most of my friends at that time thought I was nuts, though, because the homes in Vegas at that time were more expensive than Calgary. Oh, and the Canadian dollar was horrible, kind of like it is again now. Right. And uh, they thought I was totally crazy. But I could see like in my mind, it was like just so obvious that I needed to do business there. So you fast forward, the recession kicks in. Uh, Vegas is the hardest hit market, drops 80% from its peak to its lowest point. And, you know, a lot of people assume that I would have lost my shirt and, you know, my net worth went down tremendously. All the properties that I owned went way down in value, but as the U S became a nation of renters, my rents actually started to go up and I had a lot more choices of tenants. And so my cash flow actually went up. My, my net worth went down, my cash flow went up. And that was actually, uh, probably the most, uh, I guess, successful part of my career, because all of a sudden, like I said, these homes were, were on sale. I was making more cash flow than ever. And so I was taking that money, reinvesting in more and more mm-hmm. properties, knowing the market was come, gonna come back. Cause I've, I've been doing real, at that point I'd been doing real estate for about 15 years. So I've been through a few cycles, 
uh, not not quite as prevalent as that one. That was a major major drops, but uh, that's when I really loaded up my uh, portfolio. And uh, you know, shortly after that, all all my friends that used to make fun of me for investing in the states wanted to partner with you. They all said, "Hey, you know, we know we used to make fun of you, but how do we do this?" Right. And you know, I, at first I had no idea. You know, how do you, I didn't know you, so I didn't know how do I deal with cross border stuff. How do I deal with the taxes? How do I move my money back and forth? I had no clue, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity, so I just jumped in kind of head first, figured it out as I went. And then you know, when the recession kicked in, all of a sudden every Canadian wanted to invest in the U.S. Yep. And all my friends started to call me, all my friends' friends started to call me. And then out of the blue, you know, I got, I got a call from this, uh, I won't mention their name, but a very prominent real estate uh, seminar company. And, you know, they couldn't get people to show up at their events in the States. Nobody wanted to hear about real estate in those days because everybody was losing their, their shirt. Mm -hmm. But they came and they wanted to go across Canada. And they, you know, I get a call out of the blue saying, hey, Mike, you know, we're looking for a Canadian who's invested in the US and your name keeps coming up. You, you seem to be the go-to guy for this. Can you come speak for us? And I had never spoken on, on a stage in my life, nor did I uh, have any desire to. I was like right. terrified. But because, you know, the, uh, the person who, um, uh, whose company called me uh, was one of my heroes, uh, it was very hard to say no. And so next thing you know, I'm touring across Canada, you know, just as a guest speaker, speaking for like 60 to 90 minutes, talking about, you know, how do you invest in the States as a Canadian? And that opened up yet another, uh, you know, portion of my career, uh, you know, all of a sudden as a speaker, which I, like I said, I was terrified and, and it would have been so easy to say no, because I didn't really want to be in the spotlight. Uh, but, you know, as luck would have, it, it was pretty hard to say no to your heroes sometimes. And so Absolutely. I did that. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, like I said, I became a specialist first for Canadians, but then I started to get calls from people like in other parts of the world, like, you know, Australia and China. I mean, you name it, mm -hmm. all these people saying, hey, how do we invest in the U.S.? We understand you're not American, but you're doing it. How do we do it? And so next thing you know, um, I actually stopped speaking for that company because, um, you know, usually I'd come in, like I said, for 60 or 90 minutes as a guest speaker, then they'd, they'd fly me in, they'd fly me home. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time I said, hey, well, why don't I sit through the whole weekend? I'd love to see what you guys are teaching. And I remember, uh, you know, sitting through it and thinking, man, I remember we used to do that in 1992. That doesn't work anymore. And then it's like, I think that's mortgage fraud they just taught. And there's oh, a whole wonderful. bunch of stuff that didn't really sit very well with me. And so I called up, you know, I called them up and said, listen, I, I can't really put my name to this because I don't believe in what you're teaching. I can help you redo the curriculum. And they didn't care because they were making tons and tons of money. And they said, okay, well, if you don't want to speak for us, go do your own thing. And so I did. I basically set up some trainings. Back in those days, I took people to Las Vegas. I take them to the actual auctions where I would purchase uh, real estate. And that was the start of me, you know, being a mentor and coach. And then I also realized that, you know, a lot of people, uh, like somebody like yourself, who's, a, who's a, well, I know you're actually involved in real estate, but there's a lot of lawyers and doctors, their passion isn't real estate, but they know that they need to invest in it. Right. One, to lower their taxes and two, to create some passive income, right. or else they're going to have to work forever. And so, uh, so I started to create turnkey properties, meaning I, I would go buy properties, I'd fix them. Uh, we'd put tenants in place and then I'd have my property management team look after them. And we started to sell those to investors around the world who wanted to be armchair investors. They didn't want to learn mm -hmm. how to go to the auctions. They didn't want to learn how to, you know, knock on doors and cold call, do all the things that, that are involved in the day-to-day -day real estate investing. And so uh, that's kind of the start of how I got into, you know, the coaching and mentoring and teaching. And then also the, the turnkey stuff that all happened as a result of that. So um, but yeah, but the, the, the amazing thing is right now with COVID, I believe we're going to head into an even bigger opportunity than what happened in 2007, 2008. Yeah. So I am, uh, we're going full speed ahead and just you know, <clears throat> you can't shut down the global economy and not expect some, uh, some after effects. Oh my gosh. In such a big way. And the U S um, I'm sure, you know, with the forbearance, I keep talking about this because can it, in Canada, it's so different the way that they've treated mortgage forgiveness and deferrals right. than in the U S and these, and Americans, unfortunately, I think we're not aware of what the implications would be of doing this forbearance or accepting forbearance and suddenly having this balloon of four to six payments. <clears throat> so even though the banks don't want the inventory of the mortgage companies, that's what's going to start happening. And suddenly the, the opportunities to really get into the market are going to open. And the truth is one of the things that you and I share and, and with my, you know, my other Canadian partners that I met through you um, is this goal. The most important thing, I mean, granted, we all want to make money, but at the end of the day, you've made your money. 
you're good with that. You know, you, right. you like to keep making money. You like to make an impact. You like to do great things and be a philanthropist. But the reality is why you and I resonate so well with each other is because your goal now is to truly mentor others to emulate what you've done and be successful in their own right. And that is a bigger, the impact piece is more important to you, I believe, than the financial piece, especially at this point, correct? Well, absolutely. And, and even if it, even back when I, you know, when I was younger and I didn't have the, you know, obviously the same resources I do today, to me, it's all about helping. There's somebody on the other end of that transaction. And mm -hmm. so to me, being a successful real estate investor isn't finding some, you know, little old lady who doesn't know the value of her home, getting a really smoking right. deal on it. And next thing you know, you make that home run paycheck and she's living on the streets. That's not, right. that's not that's the not, goal. No, that is not the goal. The goal is to create a win-win, create something that, um, uh, you know, back, back in 2007, one of the things that I did was uh, I started up a company that I called Foreclosure Fixers. And Foreclosure Fixers, mm -hmm. uh, basically, you know, so many people, uh, when they were losing their home, you know, they thought that, you know, somebody was going to come into their property at two in the morning, uh, kick them and their kids out on the street, toss all their belongings on the front lawn, and that was going to be their fate. And they had no idea that there's a legal process behind right. this. So I took the time to actually learn the uh, foreclosure laws. I hired an attorney, sat down, I learned the foreclosure laws inside and out. And back in those days, I would actually sit across the table from these people in trouble. And you know, there, there's usually two types of people that you probably see, you've probably seen a million of those postcards. We buy homes, we buy ugly homes. Oh my gosh. Homes. Yeah. So during these times, you see a lot of, I won't say predators, it's just, you know, real estate sort investors of. trying to make a living. But I, I actually sent out a pamphlet saying, hey, we'll try it. We can help stop the foreclosure. We can help negotiate with your lender. We can, you know, so I came up with solutions that were a win for those people that were going through these really tough times. And what I found is two different types of people would call me on, uh, you know, on, on my uh, flyers. Uh, the first type of person is, you know, sometimes bad things happen to good people. And so maybe they got divorced, they got sick, they lost their job. And of course, right now during COVID times, so many people are losing their jobs, they're losing their businesses. No, nobody chose uh, to have COVID come and, and lose their jobs. And these are people quite often that, you know, pre-COVID, they had never missed a payment in their life. They would never right. dream of being late on a payment. And yet now, all of a sudden, due to circumstances beyond their control, they can't make their payments. And so for people like that, I would quite often, uh, you know, I'd put on my lender cap and I would go and I'd loan them. They could afford to make the, the you know, they lost their job, but now they're working again and they can afford to make the monthly payments, but they can't make up the, the arrears. And so they're, they're, you know, for all intents and purposes, going to lose their home to the bank. And so I would loan them the money, pay off their arrears, and they would make me monthly payments. I'd, of course, charge interest, win for them, win for me. They get to right. stay in their home. Right. But then you have this, yeah, then you have the second type of person. And that second type of person, uh, these are people that like to live beyond their means. And even if there was no COVID, I mean, very common very, here. Very yeah, common. Very, yes. And so people quite often have a way bigger house than what they need. And, sure. and you know, they just want to keep up with the Joneses. Mm -hmm. And they're living on a very, uh, you know, very thin ice to begin with. And then you, you mix in a catastrophe or a pandemic and it's like, hey, that, that was just a ticking time bomb. And that was kind of the impetus to just push them over the edge. Yeah. And people like that, you can't loan them money because they're just going to burn through it. Right. And eventually you're not, you're, you're never going to get your money back. And so for those people, I'd always try to do what I call give them a soft landing. And what I mean by that is, you know, uh, there, there'd be times where I knew I could make them such a ridiculously low ball offer because they were just so desperate. But instead, what I do is I always make sure, even if they had no equity, I'd make sure that they had, you know, a damage deposit, mm -hmm. several months rent, money for food. And I'd help not only make sure that they had a place to go after, but I'd help uh, make sure that they, uh, you know, I'd help, I'd help them rebuild and then eventually buy something that they could afford. Or sometimes I put them in one of my other properties and do a rent to own for them, but something that was affordable to them. And yeah. so, you know, for those people, uh, you know, like I said, I could have, I could have swooped in, got that home run deal and left them in a really, really bad spot. But, you know, what, what I find is that when you, uh, you know, help somebody like that, well, guess what? If they lost their job, they know 10 other people that they used to work with that lost their job. And so now instead of one paycheck, now you've got 10 paychecks. And so, uh, so those are some of the things I like to teach. And, and, you know, when I, when I saw that they were shutting down the global economy, as you, as you mentioned earlier, I'm usually traveling full time. And you know, hanging out with my grandkids or doing volunteering. I don't normally work this as hard as I've worked since. <laughs> yep. Uh, Do all amazing. these events after event after event. Yeah, but you know what? I, I when I saw they were shutting down the global economy, I'm going, here we go again. There's gonna be so many people in trouble. Yeah. And so I decided, you know, this year I'm gonna to devote to 
uh, training other people on how to be ethical investors, how to create win-wins and, you know, help other people, but at the same time, monetize it. So you get paid yourself. And so Absolutely. That's, that's, that's what I've been doing. And, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think that, uh, you know, what we're seeing right now is the tip of the iceberg, what's going to happen probably six months down the road, if not yep. sooner, you know, we have an election coming up very, very soon. Uh, I think after that election, uh, no matter who wins, uh, I don't think they're going to be just freely cutting checks to people like they are right now, trying to buy votes, et cetera. And so, um, you know, we're, we're really at the tip of the iceberg and there's going to be so many people, unfortunately in trouble and uh, so many people, uh, need our help. So originally I was thinking I would just set up my foreclosure fixers business again and, you know, maybe help 50 or hundred families this year if I'm really lucky. And then I started to think, well, what if I trained a whole bunch of other people on how to do some of these strategies uh, that I do? Mm -hmm. And I realize a lot of people right now don't have a, uh, a lot of money. So I just want everybody to know that, like I said, when I started, I had less than zero. When I bought my first two homes, I had negative. My net worth was negative. And so, so I'm going to be teaching strategies, how you can help these people, even if you have little or no cash, you have bad credit, doesn't matter. Uh, Cause I know so many people need to reinvent themselves right now. So I'm going to, you know, teach them exactly what I would do. If I, if I just lost my job, but I knew, you know, if I, if I knew 31 years ago, some of the stuff I know now, there's no way I'd go work for somebody else. Or there's, there's nothing else I would do. This just, it, it's, it's not get rich quick. It's not easy money, but if you get the right tools and the right training and, and you, uh, you know, apply, apply uh, the right things. This is, uh, it's, it's recession proof because people will always need a place to live. We're not going back to living in caves. And so uh, this business, when times are, are chaotic, this is where, uh, you know, this is where the biggest opportunities are. And so that's why I'm doing a lot of trainings this year for people. And, and it's great. And you've had such an amazing following. And I, I mean, uh, it, it's just amazing when, when you're, to give such value and over deliver. And I think that that's what separates you from the other trainers and those that you've worked with before. Um, one of the things that you mentioned is about turnkey. So, you know, I'm a turnkey service provider like you. And the reality is that as time goes on and people are busy trying to manage their lives, turnkey becomes that much more important. What does turnkey mean for you? Yeah, basically turnkey, what it means is, you know, for somebody like myself, for example, I normally like to travel full time. And so mm -hmm. I like other people to take care of my investments. I don't want to have to deal with a day to day. And so, uh, like I said, you know, we're, we're buying properties. We're typically buying properties from the bank in, in bulk, but we're also, you know, buying pre foreclosures, you know, right. people in trouble trying to rescue them. But once you buy the property, well, you still need to do something with that property. So you might mm -hmm. hold it as a rental. You might flip it. In our case, uh, we're mostly investing in Atlanta right now. And which is a really, really hot market. And we're, we're buying these properties, we inspect them, we fix every single thing that comes up on the inspection. We're putting tenants in place. Uh, we put a one-year warranty on the home. So once the tenants are in there, they're gonna find things throughout the year, especially in Atlanta, they get real seasons, not quite as uh, right. bad as Canada, luckily, but they get a real winter and a real yeah. summer. And so it gives the tenants a chance to use the AC, it gives them a chance to use the furnace. We, you know, we fix everything throughout the year. And uh, by the time an investor buys a property from us, it's already fixed. There's already somebody living there paying right. rent. Our team is already managing it. And it's just very, very hands off. And, and for somebody, it was really built for somebody who's got my lifestyle, which is kind of overkill for most people, meaning that I don't want to have to, re you know, I have quite a few properties. I don't want to have to remember when to pay property taxes and when my insurance comes due. So my property management team, not only do they look after the tenants, but they deal with all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so Literally, it's meant for somebody who uh, is busy, doesn't necessarily want to become a real estate expert, but they want the benefits of owning real estate, such as, well, put it this way, if you don't own real estate, you're paying way too much in tax. That's, that's a given. That, the richest people on the planet all own real estate for a very good reason. If you look at Warren Buffett, he didn't even make his money originally in real estate, but he helps reduce his taxable income by owning sure. a lot of real estate. And so everybody should own real estate. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a on the front lines in the trenches, real estate investor, but you definitely need to own real estate. And so my company, we do both. We help people who don't want to be experts, doctors, lawyers, engineers, people that have a passion for something else besides real estate, but know that they need uh, to own some to create the passive income, to get the tax, tax breaks, et cetera. And then there's other people who do want it. They do want to duplicate some of the stuff that I've done. They want to be on the front lines. They want to go out there and, uh, you know, they want that to be their career and that's great too. And so my company deals with both sides of that spectrum and sometimes in between, because I get some people who, you know, they'll come with me, for example, 
uh, to one of my, you know, back when I used to do live trainings before COVID hit, I take people to Houston, Texas. I teach them how to do something called tax deeds, mm -hmm. uh, where you can buy homes for pennies on the dollar. And, uh, you know, one of my students picked up a single family home worth probably 90 to a hundred thousand dollars, got it for $7,200, just wow. to give you an idea of some of the deals you see at these auctions. Uh, but you know, afterwards they realized, oh, you know, I, I like this. There's some great deals, but it's a lot of work. So maybe I just want to I'll, I'll buy some turnkey as well. When I get some people, I've had people call, you know, buy turnkey properties and they'll call me up and say, okay, well, I bought some turnkey properties and the money showed up in my bank account. What, what else am I supposed to do? I go, you're supposed to do nothing. That's, that's mm -hmm. the whole point of this. You're supposed to go find, find a hobby, go do something that keeps you busy. And they go, oh, well, I think maybe I want to learn how to do some of this real estate myself. So I guess some people that do both, uh, but uh, basically I'm, I'm there to take care of, uh, you know, people who want to either learn how to do real estate or they want it done for them, but they, they need, you know, everybody, like I said, needs to be invested in real estate one way or another. Is it a different process for your students? And I, I know the answer for my clients, but is it a different process? Cause I know when you started, you had some issues. And as you mentioned, you just kind of went full speed ahead. You didn't get tax advice. You didn't get the right counsel. You didn't have the right of cross-border expertise. What, what, was the, what were the implications of that and how do we prevent them for your students? Yeah, well, you know what? When I first started, you know, I had really two choices. I could see the opportunity was there. And I knew there was two choices. One is I could try to figure all this stuff out and then hope the opportunity was still there. Or I could do what I did and that's, I'm jumping in. I'm gonna take advantage of this opportunity. I know I'm probably gonna to pay too much taxes, which I did. I know, I, I didn't know actually that my bank was going to, uh, I won't say rip me off, that's the wrong word. Uh, but probably the proper word is charge a lot of fees. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my bank, whenever I convert the currency, they're charging a lot of extra fees. I didn't know there were other options. so. Uh, so my, my expenses were a lot higher than they should have been. I still did very, very well. So I'm very grateful that I did what I did, but for my, you know, for my clients now, when they buy a turnkey property for me, or if they're learning how to invest cross border, uh, we connect them with people like yourself to, uh, you know, help them set up the proper entities and, and do things properly. So they don't have to make the, the same trial and error mistakes that I did. They can start off by doing things right from the get go as uh, so they can keep more of what they make. So if I go back to my, my younger self, um, you know, actually, actually, you know what, I'm, I'm happy how I did it how I did, because you know what, like I said, it would have been really easy to, to learn everything there was to learn and then miss the entire opportunity and I'd still be investing in Canada. So I'm glad I did what I did, but for my students, they don't have to go through all that. Right. They don't have to pay all the they extra. They have time. access to people like myself and other members of your team that can help to make sure that they don't and pave the path to, to success without that pain. So that's, that's the beauty. And when you are investing across borders, it's much, which is the name of the podcast, it, it is much more complicated than investing in your home country. And it's really important to have guidance, both in the country into which you're investing and in your home country, no matter what. You can't just get guidance in the US. You can't just get guidance in Canada, for example, as, as is our focus today, but you, you need to have the expertise on both sides because there are considerations. We know um, um, some people that have been through American training on how to invest in real estate and the American training doesn't train you on how to deal with your Canadian implications or a 1031 right. exchange. What does that mean for Canadians, which is the exchange in like, or in like kind of one property to another to defer capital gains. So it's all about that holistic approach, the turnkey holistic approach, which Mike brings to his students and which we bring to our clients. And it's really important to work with an expert like Mike as a mentor that's been there and done that. He's been in the trenches. He's He's, you know, fallen into some traps. He's been challenged. And at the end of the day, here he is, this success story that's training others to follow suit. So I have a, a quick question. Um, sure. What would you say, I know we kind of bre bro breached, on, broached on this a little yeah. bit, can't speak, breached contract, no. Um, we kind of broached on this a bit, but how do you see in the next six months, what, what do you see happening in the real estate market, particularly in the US? Yeah, what, what I see is probably the greatest transfer of wealth in history. And when I say transfer of wealth, the key word there is transfer. So the money is not disappearing. It's not disappearing into thin air. It's being transferred. And so if you take one of those snow globes that you shake, yeah. those little pretend snowflakes go from the top yeah. to the bottom. Well, if you're, if you're well positioned, if you take the time right now, to take a little bit of a break from Netflix, and you take the time to <laughs> reinvent yourself and train yourself and educate yourself, 
which I know if they're watching your podcast, obviously uh, I'm preaching to the choir, but if you're taking this time instead of saying, hey, well, let's see what COVID brings and waiting for life to happen, uh, that's not gonna be good. If you're taking this time to reinvent yourself and figure out what you know, Mike Wolf or Lauren Cohen 2.0 looks like, and then that- 3.0? 3.0, 5.0, whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> those snowflakes, if those were $100 bills, you can position yourself yeah. to be part of that transfer on the good side of that transfer. And if you don't take the time, you're probably going to be on the bad side of that transfer. So that money, like I said, isn't disappearing, but there's going to be like so much opportunity. I mean, for example, you know, the banks haven't been allowed to foreclose on people, which is good. I mean, I hate to see a bunch of people out on the streets because they couldn't make their mortgage payment because of COVID, they lost their job. That's no fault of their own. I'd, hate, I'd absolutely hate to see that. So I'm glad the banks aren't able to foreclose, but that's not gonna last forever. And once that opens up again, there's gonna be a glut of foreclosures coming down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Those auctions that I was telling you about where my, my student got a home for $7,200, that auction has been closed for six or seven months now. And normally like a thousand homes change hands every month. So now you've got a glut, 7,000 homes that should have transferred hands that haven't. And then plus you have this whole new bunch of foreclosures coming down the pipeline. And once again, if you learn how to do this properly and you're positioned to take advantage of this or, or even better yet, instead of going to the auctions, get a hold of these people before they lose their homes and come up right. with a solution for them. Right. There is one, the ability to help a whole lot of people and two, the ability to make a lot of money uh, doing it and yep. being able to sleep really well at night knowing right. that, hey, uh, win, you know, win, I know, win. A lot, a lot of people feel like they're taking advantage of somebody and it doesn't have to be that way. And to me, if my bank account keeps going up and up and up, to me, that's just a sign that I'm, I've helped a lot of people. If my bank account is low, that means I'm not helping enough people. And so, uh, you know, I just think there's going to be so many people that are going to need our help. And that's why, like I said, even though uh, normally I don't work this hard, this is the first year in a long time I've, I've done, you know, trainings. And no, normally I do like one or two live events a year and they're like four days. I take people to Texas, I hop on an airplane, I go to the Caribbean and go lie on a beach and take it easy. Uh, this is unusual, you know, this year I'm, I'm, I've helped hundreds of students already. And uh, um, I, I, you know, if it were for, I'm actually grateful for COVID in a lot of ways because it really created the bandwidth to, to really do the stuff that I should have done anyways and really just teach as many people as possible. Uh, Cause I really want to start a movement of ethical real estate investors that are out there helping others and, and getting paid well for it. And that's really what we're doing. Yeah, you've been forced to have your boots on the ground and you had to create, you know, those of us that are in creativity mode, we can't help ourselves but create. It's certainly, I mean, when, when we originally met back in January, I wasn't as focused on the real estate market as I have been since COVID hit. And I realized that there was such a need for somebody like me with that cross-border expertise that can help people invest across borders. Because even though the borders may be physically closed, the borders aren't closed to investment and the opportunities are starting to open. And um, it's, it's really important to understand that and take advantage of the opportunities and realize that taking advantage of the opportunities does not mean something negative for the people that who, who are in these homes. You may be actually saving them from a huge foreclosure, credit issue, all kinds of stuff. There's a lot sometimes to think it's, about. It's, yeah, sometimes it's a lot more than that. You don't even know what's below the surface. I had right. one, one lady call me up probably two years after I helped her. I, I had you know, bought her home. I gave her one of those what I call soft landings and made sure she you know had a place to live. And she confided in me probably two years later and I, I didn't even really remember her when she called. But she said, I never, I never told you this, Mike, but the day that I received your, your flyer in the mail, I was actually thinking of killing myself. And so we don't know all the implications. And when people are having financial problems, there's so many other things you know, beyond that. Like if people are having financial problems, their relationships aren't working. They're probably stressed, their health isn't working. Like everything is falling apart around them. It's not just money, it's, it's their whole world is crumbling around them. And when you can go there and make a difference, you have no idea. Some of the things that you, you know, some of the good that you've done, uh, you'll never find out about. In, in this case, I, you know, she happened to call me, but, you know, when people have financial problems, there, there's so much else, but, but, you know, below the surface that uh, you're actually helping them with that you don't even know. And right now, there are so many people with so such significant financial issues. And the truth is that, like Mike said, you don't know what's beneath the surface and the mental health issues across mm -hmm. North America, across the world, but particularly in North America are, are, are bad. And people are like here in America with the election, you know, people not being able to travel, um, um, not being able to see their family like me. Um, <laughs> you know, my family's in yeah. Toronto, but the reality is that we are very fortunate because 
those of us that have come out of, of this, come through COVID, at the beginning, as you know, I was helping people get access to all of the money that was available. And that made a big difference for me. Um, I didn't make a lot of money doing it, but I really helped a lot of people stay in business. And that was a great feeling. And just like you, you're helping people. So I think that the important thing, the, the most important takeaway from this is as a heart-centered entrepreneur, real estate investor, influencer, you have taken this negative and turned it into a positive with the help of some friends that we know. Mm -hmm. And yes. we are very grateful. And sometimes it just takes that little tweak to say, oh, I could do these online events and train lots and lots of people. You know, for me, it's been good because I have, I, I'm, a, I'm a single mom and travel is not always easy for me. Well, now I can be booked on stages all over the world, literally right. without leaving my home. I was on with a, with John Medved from our crowd the other day. I'm sure you know of him um, yes. from Israel. And, and it was like, no big deal. He's seven hours ahead. We're, we're on the, we're just on the zoom doing our podcast. So Absolutely. You know, it's a, I think that it's all about mindset, which you teach in your course as well. You even teach it in your, in your um, um, events. And th that's not a very common thing for men to do, but I think men are becoming more in touch with the reality that mindset is as important as what's in your bank account. And if you can turn your mindset into a success mindset, a winner mindset, a win-win impact mindset, you're going to be a successful like Mike. And, and Mike, how can we reach you? Although I'm obviously going to put it all in the show notes, but you want to just quickly tell us. Yeah, well, you can uh, email me info at mikewolfmastery.com. Info at mikewolfmastery.com is uh, how you can reach me by email. And uh, if anybody wants to uh, sign up for my next uh, event, I know you're going to put a link in there. And by, by the way, the, this is going to be uh, the third time I've done it. The first time I did it, I actually charged $997 for it. I paid. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You were there and, and we got amazing feedback on it. it. But great. I also got a lot of people saying, hey, you know what? I, don't, I just don't have right. like an extra $997 right now and, you know, lost my job and I really want the training. And so I actually decided to make it so everybody can afford it because my, my real goal, I don't, I don't get rich off doing these uh, events, by the way, uh, but I enjoy doing these events. And But anyway, I decided to make it $97. So absolutely everybody can afford to attend. Uh, I'm going to give you 31 years of knowledge. I'm going to give you, I don't hold, well, you know, Lauren, I don't hold anything back. There's no fluff. Um, and, and you hit it right on, you know, the nail right on the head because, you know, mindset is one of the most important parts. If you don't have that right, I can give you all the strategies and tactics and show you how to do things. But if you have the wrong mindset, it's not going to work. And I see a lot of people actually repel money because yep. uh, like I said, they're, they're feeling, oh, well, these people were, they lost their job in COVID and I feel like I'm taking advantage of them while I'm down. No, you're not taking advantage of them. You're changing their life. Changing their life. You're getting paid for it. You're leaving them in a way better position. And, and yeah. you know, imagine these people all lost their homes to the bank. Where are they going to go? I mean, we're going to see a, a, a massive, even more massive homeless population. It's already bad enough pre-COVID. Uh, it's just going to be a nightmare unless there's it people is. that are on the front lines doing ethical investing and helping these other people. And that's that's my goal is to train as many people as possible, get a movement. Uh, and, you know, like I said, I could do foreclosure fixtures myself, or if I can train, you know, a thousand people to duplicate what I'm doing, we can help a lot of families this it's year. like you can teach a man to fish. What is, how does that saying go? Or you can show him. Well, you give him a fish or you can teach him how to fish. So I'm going right. to teach you how to fish. So you're, right. you're, not, uh, right. really, you're not reliant. Right. And actually there's one more thing at the beginning, you mentioned about buying zoom stock. So I'll share a quick story with you. So when COVID started, you know, I'm, I'm with EXP Realty. I, not only am I a cross-border lawyer, I'm also a realtor and I'm with EXP and it's a cloud-based real estate company. And I joined because my boyfriend is in EXP and I was like, okay, it sounds good. I really wasn't buying and selling real estate. Although funny thing is I'm about to put my first offer together in 12 years. Can you imagine 12 right. years of having my real estate license and I'm doing an offer for a, a, a buyer, which is kind of crazy. But the point is when he said, buy some stock in EXP. I was like, ah, whatever. I don't know if you know the EXP story. I'm sure you do. It was I, I know a little bit about it. Yeah. $8 in April, okay. $62 on Friday. Wow. Wow. That's okay. pretty impressive. 800% almost. That is crazy. So if, so in our group, we have people that have been receiving stock because it's a revenue share and you receive stock for every transaction. And now they've got like six and seven figures of stock 
And it's crazy. And I, of course, I'm like, oh, but the, but the truth is that you can't go, oh, you have to take advantage and seize the opportunity when it's there. All of these tech companies, the reason that EXP is doing so well, like Zoom, is because it's very tech focused. So technology is where it's at. Um, we, we, I appreciate your time, Mike. I'm, I, I'm excited. This is my first podcast interview. I think well, it was very a honored, by the way. Thank you for, ha for having me as your first guest. That's uh, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I couldn't think of a better first guest to have. And, uh, now I'm going to go do your work for you. So thank you again. <laughs> have a wonderful day and we'll talk soon. Thanks so much, Lauren. Okay. Bye-bye. I don't know. It's not my, my mouse is not. Uh oh, it's all right. It'll work. You sign off and then I'll sign off instead of bugging you. I'll just stop the recording a little early. There you go. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Mike. And, um, if you need any help or anything, let me know. And uh, Did I do okay? I think you did great. Okay. Yeah, you, you, it's like you've been doing this all your life. Well, you know, I have been on enough podcasts. I better not oh, exactly. do it from That's the right. other side. Like, yeah, I, I, think I, I think I did I, five last week alone. So it was a little Yeah, crazy. and I think you had good energy. You asked good questions.